Any other thoughts on that? So, John, you would extend that to any any contract, uh, any outside contractor for the attorney general. How about throughout all of government? Same thing. Well, any outside contractor? Well, use? again, the FPPC has a lot of regulations on this, and and there are limits on doing business with the state and giving uh, giving campaign contributions, and and uh, uh, we think those laws are are needed and justified. I'm just trying to create some yeah. uh, disagreement. I mean, it has to be a situation. <laughs> well, here's the problem. I mean, you had a $2 million contract. These were, these were uh, confidential in, until the AP's investigative report. A $2 million contract going to a, a, a law firm that had donated to Lockyer and another no-bid contract, uh, half a million dollars to a Lockyer friend who was a lobbyist. So this is the kind of stuff we're trying to stop, you know, trying to put shed light on. and. Um, when there's no standards, no accountability, no light on anything, this, this is what you get. Well, the, the, and, and the actual abuse that, you, that we do want to stop is the abuse of somebody getting hired because he or she has an in with the attorney general. So that person is not being hired on the merits, uh, but rather uh, because of one's influence. And uh, there are various ways to, to you know, uh, 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 mitigate that, but if you really want to prohibit it, if you really want to, make, want to make sure it doesn't happen, then you just have a very simple rule, as we were saying, that, that we're, we're, if you've given a contribution any time in the last two years, you're disqualified from bidding on that contract, from becoming uh, uh, the outside counsel to, to, to the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I might say that if we were to, if, if that makes sense to people um, as, a, as a general proposition, the one, another place where it makes even more sense um, is, is, in, is in our courts. Um, because as you know, uh, in California, some judges, not all, but some judges uh, run for election and then re-election. And then, and, and when they do, uh, uh, some of them uh, have to raise campaign, uh, have to raise money, campaign contributions, and most of those campaign contributions come from lawyers. And they don't just come from any lawyers, they come from the lawyers who end up practicing before those very judges. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, we all get upset sometimes about things, about, about things that look like the mere scintilla of an appearance of a conflict of interest. The press is, 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 is always jumping up and down when it thinks it's caught somebody in, in, in what looks like a, a possible conflict of interest. Well, I would submit that you certainly, there is certainly a, 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 an extreme appearance of a conflict of interest problem whenever um, counsel bef uh, appearing before a judge have contributed money to that uh, judge's campaign, uh, particularly if the lawyer on the other side of the case has not. So I would, uh, I, what, I, what I would love to see is a, uh, a similar prohibition that, that lawyers, who, uh, lawyers who have given money to a, a judge within the last two years would simply be disqualified from representing parties before that judge. There are plenty of other lawyers, um, but just the ones who um, would uh, 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 potentially might be able to uh, influence improperly uh, the outcome, even if, in fact, they don't. It's the appearance of a conflict of interest that so undermines the confidence in the, ju in the judicial system um, that we ought to extend that prohibition uh, to, the, to the courts as well. Other comments on that? Bob? Just a question. I guess, you know, um, Peter mentioned two years, and I don't know what, what the right answer is to this question, but, you know, how long is, is long enough? Um, I'm sure judicial and other candidates remember more than two years ago who their campaign contributors were. In California, there's a, there is an opinion of the um, California Judges Association, which has been the advisory branch uh, to judges, which um, uh, refers to in judicial elections. Uh, it's two years. Um, whether that has changed or not, you know, it's uh, since I, last time I read it. Let me, uh, at this point, ask if there's any members of the audience who have questions. So, um, I don't know, we don't, we don't have a microphone, so we'll just ask you to speak up. 
And why don't we start down here and go around, okay? We got plenty of time. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm uh, Ruben Garcia, and I teach uh, professional responsibility here at California Western. And um, forgive me if this question seems to focus on some of the more technical aspects of the proposals. I mean, I think that there's a lot of variation in practices and a lot of... Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this over here. Oh, thank you. And those of you who have questions, you can just come on down here and we'll uh, have you post. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of variation in practices about what you all are talking about. I mean, obviously, in some cases, there has been a lack of disclosure. In some cases, there have been um, large attorney's fees awards. Um, and, and, and again, the, the, you know, I, I think that we have to remember that each state is, is different in terms of its legal framework, but I, I want to focus in on a couple, I guess I'll call them the four C's. First of all, contributions, the issue of contributions. I think that, I'm not an expert on this, but I think that states, generally for all contractors, have rules about pay-to-play contracts and contributions. So the first question I would have for the panel would be, why should we single out lawyers um, in particular for special scrutiny about contributions and and uh, sort of pay-to-play kind of situations. The second one is client. So the, cl the, the second C is client, and that is who, it was a, a great question asked by Judge Goldsmith, who is the client here really? And so is there a thought or any, are any of you thinking about proposals to better define who the client is? Uh, in the, in, you know, uh, Bob Gaglione talked about the constitutional set. We don't have a definition of client in the Constitution, right? Who the Attorney General's client is. So that's why we have so many of these of these issues. The third is um, I, I'm, I'm totally in favor of um, um, full disclosure, sunshine, um, but I do think that with regard to lawyer-client relationships, and again this gets back to the, the second C, who the client is. If the client is the state of California, is it, uh, you know, if, if not an actual breach of confidentiality, at least a uh, something that lawyers and clients would not really like to have, and that is having their fee agreements up on the internet. I'll, I think all of you would probably bristle a little bit at that possibility. So who's the client here? If the client is the people of the state of California, then you know, they should see their, their fee agreements, right? So, so that's the, 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 the thing we have to define. Uh, and then uh, the final uh, thing is just the contingency fee issue. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, as all of you know, uh, contingency fee arrangements can sometimes um, be higher than the typical hourly rate. And that's because they're compensating the risk, the risk involved in uh, taking these cases. And as has been pointed out, uh, if the, it, I, just, I just wasn't clear on who's actually paying here. It, in some cases, it sounded like the client or that the state was paying out of its funds. But I, I thought that it was my understanding that the defendant in a contingency fee or settlement case uh, was actually paying. So the state wasn't actually paying out anything. So I'd just like some clarification on those, on those four items. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The excellent questions. Um, who would love, Bob? And let me, let me give you the microphone if you want to have a little bit of uh, follow-up. Um, I'll trust you with, can I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think uh, the first C was the contributions, and if I understood the question, um, I, I believe, and I think most of the panelists would probably agree, that, that we're not limiting, although we may have said so uh, earlier, this, this shine, sunshine onto the contributions of attorneys. I think anyone who may stand to benefit from state contracts, we're just focusing specifically today on, on the type of litigation that attorney generals may farm out to law firms, but I think you, you want to shine a light on all the contributions as, as much as possible. Uh, secondly, as to the clients, and, and earlier I think uh, John had mentioned that the people are the, the client. Um, theoretically, that's the correct answer, but when there is a large settlement, do we all get rebate checks? Do we get tax reductions? Typically, no. Where does that money go? And, and following these, the settlement monies, they usually end up in, in the budgets of various agencies of the state. Sometimes maybe the Attorney General's office keeps some of it, but um, I think that's something that we need to do a little bit more follow-up on. And, and are the people really the client, practically speaking? I think theoretically, clearly we are, but when the Attorney General does receive a large settlement of monies, like the tobacco monies, it, there's been some articles written on, on where that money was distributed, and I, I can tell you I'm still waiting for my tax rebate check on the tobacco litigation. I'm sure all of you are as well. 